We're living through this biodiversity crisis, the sixth mass extinction event, and it's our own creation, and it's just, you know, it's, it's happening on, on our watch. I was initially more, more focused on butterflies and moths. I, I guess because they're beautiful, really. Um, but I started studying bumblebees about 30 years ago. I was sitting in a, in a, in a meadow and watching some bees in a patch of flowers. And I noticed something really, something I couldn't explain, which, which anyone can see. So if, if you uh, find a bee visiting flowers and you watch her, she flies from flower to flower. As she approaches a flower, she has her antennae out. And sometimes she veers off as if there's something wrong with the flower. And you can see this is really, really common. And I, I sort of, I wonder what, what they're doing. What's wrong with the flower? Basically, they're sniffing the flower for the, for the smelly footprint of a previous recent visitor to the flower. When a bee lands on the petals of the flower, she accidentally leaves a little smear of oils from her cuticle. Just, just like when you, when you put down a glass, you leave a, a fingerprint, they leave a little footprint. And, and so the bees sniff the flower, and if they can smell that another bee has recently been to the flower, they'll, it, it will be empty so they don't bother landing. I, I, so I, I spent years studying this and, and understanding what was going on. And by, by the end of it, I guess I was sort of hooked and had realized that bees are really clever. They live complicated social lives. Um, uh, they, they learn, they navigate, they, they, their behavior is really fascinating. There's been a, a big increase in interest in bees specifically. In the last 20 years or so, there's been a, a sort of a, a, a wave of recognition and, and, of the importance of bees as pollinators of our crops. And, and a, a just generally a, 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 a growth in enthusiasm for, for bees specifically, but not for insects as a whole, I don't, I don't think. While there has been a, 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 an increase in kind of awareness of, and, and love, if you like, for bees, um, at the same time, the environment's been co collapsing. In my lifetime, I've seen common species become rare species, become extinct in, in the United Kingdom, some globally. Um, and, you know, we, we're living through this biodiversity crisis, the sixth mass extinction event. And it's our own creation, and it's just, you know, it's, it's happening on, on our watch. The German data, I guess, remains one of the most dramatic examples of, of insect decline. 76% uh, in 27 years, which is terrifying if, if it's real, and it seems to be real. I think it's a combination of factors. It's, it's partly... Um, probably drift of pesticides and fertilizers onto the protected land from many of the nature reserves are surrounded by intensive farmland. The nature reserves are isolated. Um, many of them are a long way from another nature reserve, so no population of an organism can survive forever in isolation. Climate change isn't just about warming, it's about chaos and less predictable weather and so on. But, but the, the basic message that it's, that it's getting warmer and that that's going to cause flooding and droughts and so on is fairly straightforward. Biodiversity is much messier. We, we, there are so many species, millions of species, and we don't have data for most of them. We can't accurately quantify what's, what's happened. We don't know how many species we've lost or how many we're losing. It is good news. They're pretty awful chemicals for, for wildlife. They're incredibly toxic to insects of all types um, and they're quite persistent in the environment. They pollute soils, streams, 
hedgerow flowers and they're clearly impacted on, on bee populations and probably all insect populations um, and may well have helped drive that, the, the, the German data in part. But we shouldn't celebrate really uh, too much because they're, they're just being replaced. Um, and it, until, until we move away from a system of farming which, which looks for a chemical solution to every problem, it will never, it'll never get any better. You know, we, we, we don't seem to learn any lessons. It's so frustrating. It's, uh, it shows a complete failure to understand the, the, the evidence. The first evidence that neonicotinoids harmed wildlife were, uh, was the evidence that honeybees were dying near flowering crops treated with neonicotinoids, sunflowers, oilseed rape, and so on. Um, and it, it quickly became clear that if you treated the, the seed of the crop, the, the chemical went through the tissues, into the nectar, into the pollen, and poisoned pollinators of those crops. I think it's, it's pretty clear that it's, it's quite harmful to some nocturnal flying insects. We've all seen moths flying round and round, bashing into lights, being eaten by bats and spiders and so on that are, that are using, you know, they're easy prey. But there's, there's now evidence that light pollution also um, affects the life cycle, the timing of the life cycle. Um, many insects judge when to come out of hibernation by the day length. Um, but if, if the day length is artificially lengthened by lights, then, then an insect might think it's, it's spring in the middle of winter and emerge and then it will die. I think you just have to take them out into a meadow or a wood, give them a pot and say, catch an insect. And they love it. They, I've taken primary school children out, groups of them, and they get so excited. I think most children love insects, given chance to, 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 to interact with them. Um, uh, and, and it's really sad that, that they grow out of that if they're not given a chance. Um, and so most, most teenagers and adults, if, if an insect buzzes near them, their reaction is, is you know, ah, and they try and kill it, they're frightened, um, which I find terribly depressing. And, uh, and so it's ignorance, I guess. Um, but it, it, it's a real problem, and it's kind of, you know, my mission in life these days is to, is to try and turn that around and persuade people to love insects. People are aware of climate change and maybe biodiversity loss, but they don't vote according to, to, to that. Um, so we need to change that. We need to, we need to somehow mobilise millions of us to, to vote. If, if we started voting for the Green Party or whatever the equivalent is, um, the mainstream parties would take on board those green policies. I don't know. For some species it's too late already. Climate change will continue to get worse for probably centuries. So, but it, it's, it's not win-lose. Uh, you know, the, the, if we can save some of the environment, if we can save some species, that's better than, than none. We've developed a system of farming which is basically destroying the planet. So we need to enact policies to, to radically move, you know, we need more organic farming, we need more crop diversity, we need way fewer pesticides, ideally no pesticides. All of that will only happen if, if, if government policies and subsidies drive it, and it could happen really quickly if, if, if those policies were enacted. I would also set aside more land for nature, and I think the two go hand in hand. The least productive areas shouldn't be farmed at all. They should be set aside as much bigger nature reserves than we have at present, rather than subsidising inefficient farming that produces very little food. 
Um, so I'm thinking of mountainous areas in particular. I, it's brilliant. I hope you are ever more successful. If we can bring about a whole new generation growing up that, that, that are that are used to seeing insects and loving insects and are happy to invite them into their gardens. That will save the world ultimately. Mm -hmm.